Hello, I am the Mighty Pez. In this video, I will be discussing digital flip-flop circuits and will be demonstrating how to use these ICs along with momentary push-button switches to build a toggle switch circuit. So please, join me. For a current project, I wanted to assemble an 8-bit register with manual data load using toggle switches in homage to one of the first computers I ever worked on. One of the memories I had from operating that computer was that there was no BIOS, ROM, or disk to load the operating system from. To boot the computer, you had to enter the initial boot program into memory one byte at a time using eight push-button toggle switches lit with incandescent bulbs to tell you if the bit was enabled. The store operation loaded each instruction into memory, incrementing the address and clearing the toggle lights. Then you repeated the process, loading the program from a code listing until after the last instruction you pushed the run button. The initial boot program controlled a paper tape reader, which then loaded a full bootloader into memory. Executing the full bootloader loaded a second punch tape containing the operating system, and if all loaded correctly, the computer was up and running. Many older computers from the 50s through the 70s, including early PDPs, Novas, MSA, or Altair computers, used a standard on-off toggle switch to set bits to the 1 or 0 state. Although there is nothing wrong with that design, and would surely make for a much simpler build, my desire to reclaim the feeling of operating a specific system for my youth led me to desire a toggle function built using momentary switches which could be programmatically set and cleared. This design allows for a one button push operation to store the register to memory and clear without having to physically clear toggles separately between operations. Thinking about various solutions, I decided that I was going to implement this circuit with a momentary switch and a flip-flop integrated circuit. So the next question is what style flip-flop would I use? I had a couple of examples of various ICs already in my spare parts bin, so this was the perfect opportunity to refresh my three decades old recollection of how different flip-flops operated. Let's start with a quick overview. A flip-flop is a circuit that can store a 1-bit state and can be used to build a memory circuit. There are different types of flip-flops, each with different considerations regarding how the data value can be set. We will review two different types of flip-flops, the D flip-flop and the JK flip-flop. A D flip-flop is characterized by a data input line, the value of which is used to set the state of the circuit. With the D flip-flop IC, we have two primary inputs, the D or data line and the clock. Additionally, we can see a couple of optional inputs in lighter gray. However, I will delay discussion of these inputs. The output of the flip-flop is denoted by the letter Q. Some flip-flop ICs also have a Q bar or Q inverse output containing the opposite state of the Q output. The output state is controlled by the current value of the D input line at the time that the clock is triggered. Note that the clock input is edge triggered, which means that either the rising or falling edge, depending on the specific IC, will trigger the flip-flop. Since the specific edge is dependent on the IC used, we will simply note the term trigger in the state table. The state table shows us that if an input line is low when the clock is triggered, then the output will be low, and vice versa. Any state change on the input line without a trigger will have no change in output state. Here we can see the wiring necessary to create a toggle using a D flip-flop. Let's start with the assumption that the IC has a dedicated clock per segment. However, this is not always the case, as some ICs have a shared clock for all flip-flops on the same IC and will require a slightly different configuration. The wiring is simple as the inverted output is fed into the input pin, 
and when the clock is triggered, the output states of Q and Q bar swap. Now we look at how to handle the increased complexity of a shared clock. On an IC where all flip-flop segments share one clock, the previous wiring solution would transition all segments simultaneously. Obviously, this would prevent us from controlling each flip-flop separately. Our solution is to take the output of Q instead of Q bar and exclusive ORing it with the switch. Each switch will drive both a single flip-flop input and be joined together into one shared clock using an OR gate. As we can see from the state table, only a switch in a high state, as the shared clock is triggered, would cause output to change. Any flip-flop without the button high would not change state. A JK flip-flop is characterized by triggering one of two inputs, a set or reset input to bring the stored value of the flip-flop high or low. The J input when high will set Q output high when the clock is triggered. The K input when high will set the Q output to go low when the clock is triggered. For our case, the JK flip-flop has a nice feature. If both J and K are high when the clock triggers, the output of Q and Q bar will swap. However, if both inputs are low when the clock triggers, there is no change. In this case, use of the JK flip-flop removes the need for an exclusive OR gate, even if the clock is shared, although an OR gate would still be needed if there is a shared clock to combine several switches into one clock trigger. Before we demonstrate actual circuits, let's talk about optional features of certain flip-flops. Some ICs have preset and clear inputs, which can be used to set flip-flops to a desired starting state without a clock signal. Additionally, some ICs are referred to as tri-state and have an output pin enable, which lets us use these circuits on a shared bus by allowing you to set the internal state without outputting the data onto the bus until we are ready. Hence the tri-states, 0, 1, and high impedance or no output. Notice that both the 74112 and 7474 IC each have a dedicated clock per segment, whereas the 74173 has a single shared clock per IC. This is not the result of the type of flip-flop, but rather the design of the specific IC. These options won't immediately affect our demonstration. However, we must be aware of these inputs even if unused and ensure that they are tied to a desired state so that they don't have an unexpected effect on our circuit. Also, you must be aware of the direction of the clock edge that will cause the circuit to trigger. It is very important that you verify whether the trigger will be on the rising or the falling edge. This is one of the reasons that you will see an inverter symbol on the diagrams. We will use one or more inverters in a chain configuration. An odd number of inverters will be used when we need to trigger on a falling edge when the input goes high. An even number of inverters will be used when we need to trigger on the rising edge when the input goes high. A second reason for the inverter is that each inverter will add a delay to the clock which is necessary to ensure that the input to the flip-flop is settled before the clock is triggered. If the inputs and the clock line transition at the same time, the circuit will likely not work as expected. Our first example will be a 74175 quad D flip-flop with a shared clock triggering on a rising edge. I have pre-tied all of the unused inputs and those inputs that are statically high. On the board, you can see that I've used gray connect wire to represent unused inputs tied to ground to differentiate from the IC's ground pin, which is connected by a black connect wire. Inputs that are tied high and the supply voltage pin are all connected using red wires. Our input will be tied to 5 volt and a pull down resistor to ground. This means that in an open state, the input will be in a default low state and when in a closed state will go high. As a reminder, in this circuit the input to the D-pin will be the result of the button in a high state being exclusive ORed with the value of Q at the time the clock is triggered, thus generating a toggle. 
Now let's assemble the circuit. First, I will connect the button to the first input of the exclusive OR gate with a yellow wire. Then connect the output Q to the second input of the exclusive OR gate with a green wire. Next, connect the output of the exclusive OR gate to the input D pin on the flip-flop with an orange wire. Now I will connect the switch to the inverter with a yellow wire. We will also connect the output Q to an LED so that we can view the state of the flip-flop with a green wire. Lastly, we will connect the output of the inverter to the input clock on the flip-flop with a white wire. In this case, we are inverting the input twice to get the desired delay while leaving the signal in its original phase as this IC is triggered on a rising edge. And now we test. Sure enough, the toggle works as expected. Our second example will be a 74 112 dual JK with dedicated clocks per flip-flop. We are following the same convention with this circuit and will use yellow connect wire to signify the switch trigger, green wire to signify output, and white wire to signify the clock trigger. As a reminder, in this circuit we expect the set and reset pins, J and K, to both go high before the clock is triggered, thus generating a toggle. So the steps we'll follow are, first, we will connect the button with both the J and K input pins using yellow connect wire. Next, we will connect the button to the inverter using yellow connect wire. Thirdly, we will connect the output to the LED using green connect wire. And last, we will connect the output of the inverter to the clock input. In this case, we trigger on a falling edge, so we need an odd number of inversions to get the clock out of phase with the button rising edge. Again, we test, and it looks good. Finally, I will demonstrate my project circuit. I chose a 7474 series IC, a dual D-type IC with a dedicated clock per flip-flop. This reduced complexity by foregoing the exclusive OR chip, resulting in only two types of ICs being used. Because we feed the output of the flip-flop's inverted Q-bar output directly into the data input via the green wire, each button only feeds the clock input. Since the 7474 triggers on a rising edge, inversion is not necessary. Since the switch is not feeding data lines, we do not need a delay on the switch triggered clock line. However, we still want to clean up switch noise to prevent multiple triggering. For this, I chose an LS20P 9 segment debounce IC from LogiSwitch. Using this IC, I am able to reduce pin count to support the 8 inputs. Each switch only requires a single in out pair on the LS series IC versus the pins required by two or more inverters. A single 20-pin IC will support the eight trigger buttons with an input to spare. I connect the trigger switch to the LS20 debounce IC via the yellow wire and take the clean output to trigger each dedicated clock using the orange wire. The output is then fed via the brown wire to the LED for display. I have added a reset button to trigger the dedicated clear pin on each flip-flop via the purple connect wire. You can see that each button will trigger a single output to change state, and the clear button will set all outputs to a low state. This circuit can also be easily scaled out to support address lines as well. Thank you for watching. And I hope this video has given you a good understanding of the D and JK type flip-flops and how I will be using them in my project. My next step will be to wire this circuit into a memory circuit to be used to load data into static RAM. That will be a task for a future video.